Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about automating development environments with Ansible and Chamoy. I'll go into what that means in a little bit. Um, here's the, the rough flow. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what I mean by development environment. Going to talk about um, why I, I sort of approach things the way that I do, and then we're going to talk about a couple of tools, uh, specifically Ansible and Chamoy. And then uh, I want to show a few resources for further inspiration. Uh, my goal in this uh, talk is to get everyone excited about, uh, you know, sharing their development environment and replicating your development environment. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll feel uh, inspired to go check some more things out. So first off, uh, a little bit about me. I am a principal software engineer at Red Hat, where I work on subscriptions on console.redhat.com. I'm the tech lead for a team that does subscription analytics. Uh, it's a lot of OpenShift, Java, um, specifically some Quarkus and Spring Boot, uh, and a little bit of Tekton. Uh, I'm based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. This is my first time o over on the West Coast, uh, first time at scale. Excited to be here. Uh, weather's been lovely. And uh, if you'd like to get into contact with me for any reason, there are a couple ways. Um, I have other communication channels, obviously, so if you want to talk, uh, come chat, and I'll, we'll figure something out. So uh, first up, the, I want to sort of put into perspective why you should think about automating your uh, development environment. And when I say development environment, I mean literally the environment that you're working in every day, um, generally thinking both your system and your home directory, your configs, all of that stuff. Um, so, so here are a few big reasons. So um, one is y you replace a system. Systems fail for many reasons. Uh, and you can restore from a backup, and that works. Um, I did that for years. There's nothing wrong with that generally, except you get quirks sometimes, like you'll get driver incompatibilities or uh, other, you know, strange artifacts of, that have just kind of hung around. So sometimes it's nice to start uh, a little bit more from scratch. Um, another thing, you know, sometimes you'll replace hardware uh, for better hardware. Uh, I know like a lot of folks experimenting with LLM stuff are looking at hardware for that. Um, another reason that it's useful to automate is when you have more than one machine. Uh, quick show of hands in the audience. Uh, raise your hands if you have two or more machines that you work on regularly. All right, pretty, pretty big crowd. Okay, how about uh, just one? Okay, and uh, I'd actually challenge those who raise their hand for one, because I'd say you probably also use your phone. Um, just, just a little quirk there. Um, so wh what's interesting, uh, you know, with tools like Termux, sometimes people use their phones even s similar to the way they use their laptops. So you can take some of these concepts and even apply them uh, to, your, to your cell phone, if you so desire. Um, and uh, another thing I'd point out, some people may not have raised their hands or might not have been thinking about uh, machines that you remote into. So if you have a machine on a cloud provider that you use regularly for, for some tasks. Um, and then um, another big reason for me personally is uh, I'll pick up things at work and then I'll say, oh, that was an awesome tool or awesome config. I want to go apply that at home and vice versa. You know, um, so, so it's nice to be able to share uh, those artifacts between my home machine and my work machine. So uh, framing-wise, this is an old, um, pretty common uh, analogy at this point. It's been around a long, long time, but there's, there's the whole pets versus cattle framing. Uh, and for anybody who's not familiar with that framing, so the, this is a way of looking at systems uh, and thinking about how you want to, to manage them. So pets, you give a name, you take care of, they have individual needs, so you give them a lot of attention. And then cattle are uh, less individualized, they usually get numbers, um, you know, when you get 
new cattle or, or you know, cattle pass away, it's, it's not the same as if a pet uh, passes. Uh, and, and so the idea behind that analogy is uh, things that you have a lot of you want to spend a little bit less time on. Uh, I find it an interesting analogy to sort of frame, um, you know, like a development environment on because it's somewhere in between. Uh, I, I often find that I'm doing lots of little um, quirks. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll try a config, and then uh, I also don't want to then go reinvent that same config change on another machine. Um, so for me, it, you know, my question about that analogy, maybe it's a bad one, actually, because what about pet cows? Um, people do actually keep cows as pets. It's not super common. Uh, but, but it is a thing that happens, and uh, I, I like to, to throw that out there because I think that line uh, between something that you want to be able to manage a whole fleet of, of systems and, you know, something you want to spend some individualized attention on, it's actually a lot blurrier than, than you might um, think initially. There are other uh, good motivations for wanting to automate your um, setup. So one is that it's an opportunity to learn a new skill. Uh, there's also an opportunity to share with, with others, and sharing could be you know, with, with your team, it could be with friends, it could be with the community, uh, and of course, you know, there's a cool factor. It's always fun to try something new, look at a new technology, um, One um, downside to spending time on this is, is like, th this is a slide I always, or a XKCD rather, that I always like think back on and reference all the time. And time you spend automating is time uh, that, that you're not spending on other tasks. And, and there's actually a bit of a, um, a, a sort of cutoff point where it's no longer valuable to spend that time automating. Um, so, so that's like a piece of advice I would give when you start thinking about automation. Do keep this in mind. Um, that, that being said, if you're automating something because you want to learn new technology, maybe this doesn't matter as much. Uh, but, but certainly, like if you're looking at um, you know something on the job, this is something you you want to keep in mind. So. Um, Next, I want to dive in a little bit and talk about the way that I think about my development environment. So I think of it in terms of layers, and the, the most important layer is that base operating system install. That's sort of the foundation for everything else. Then uh, things kind of branch. You have system customizations, so things like packages you install, configuration that you change. And then on the other side, you have uh, per user customizations. And this is things like config files, uh, tools that you install that, that you're using just with that user, and uh, scripts that, that you write and use. And uh, what I'm hoping to show is that there are good uh, solutions for uh, sharing all of these things and good solutions for automating all of these things. So first, for the, the base OS install, my advice is actually to just install and accept the defaults. And there is, is a reason, and, and I'd compare that to, say, uh, unattended install, like a kickstart if you're looking at a Red Hat family system. Uh, or a uh, custom install image. So this is where you are not installing the, the vanilla flavor of the operating system. You're doing some customization of that uh, live image or installer and then installing that image. The reason for me, and, and this is just a preference, but the reason for me that I landed on just install and accept the defaults is because it's one less thing to maintain. If I'm not maintaining uh, you know, an unattended installation configuration, that's one less thing that I have to think about. It's one less variable. There's another downside to that um, if you do go the unattended install route. 
which is you generally set up users there. Not always, but if you are setting up a user in that uh, unattended install or the customized image, then you're going to have to put credentials in. And so from a security perspective, that's not great. I would rather personally uh, put in my credentials at install time so that it's only happening locally. I'm not storing them anywhere. To me, that feels like a better security posture. So um, I, this talk is about Ansible and Shmoy. Uh, and first, I'm going to talk about Ansible. And I want to say specifically, I'm talking here about uh, the Ansible that you can get by default that's available in distro packages. I'm not talking about the Ansible product. Uh, so why Ansible? Uh, one big reason to, to use Ansible for this is that Ansible is good at a lot of different things. It's a great skill to pick up. Uh, it's written in Python primarily, which means that uh, it's, it's pretty easy to jump in and make it do things that it doesn't do by default. Although I would caution, um, if you think it doesn't do a thing, double check because there's a lot of um, modules for, for lots of different uh, use cases. So um, quick show of hands, uh, how many folks use Ansible regularly? Okay, awesome. Seems seems like about a 50-50 in the room. Um, for anybody who doesn't use Ansible yet, it's I mentioned before, it's packaged with most distributions, so getting it installed is pretty straightforward. If you're on a RHEL family, it's just a DNF install. For folks on a Debian family, uh, including Ubuntu, it's just an app install away. Uh, and once you've gotten Ansible installed, uh, if you're looking to set up a project where you're going to maintain some of the state, um, what I would recommend is just to go ahead and create a role. Uh, for those who have used Ansible before, how many folks are familiar with creating a role? Okay. Pretty good amount. Um, so, so it's pretty straightforward, and there's actually a few different ways. Um, but what I, I prefer is to do this Ansible Galaxy command. Uh, this, this will essentially just scaffold out an Ansible role. And just, just uh, for anybody who's not familiar with Ansible roles, it's a collection of, of uh, automation code that, that serves a particular purpose. Uh, and so in this case, I'm suggesting that you create an Ansible role on your machine uh, with your name hyphen environment. When you do that, uh, you get some, some files created. And uh, there's a lot that goes into a role, and I'm not um, going to go into all of it in this talk. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mainly focus on three things. So the, the first are the, the tasks that you add to that role. That's uh, where the tasks main.yaml comes into play. And then I'm going to talk through templates and files. And um, if, if you want to learn more about those other directories, I'd, I'd recommend checking out like the Ansible documentation. It's really great. Um, but, but hopefully you'll feel inspired to want to go do that after this. So once you've got this role uh, set up and in place, there, there's a workflow. Um, and, and I do this all the time personally. Uh, and that workflow is anytime you want to make a system level change to, uh, to your system, instead of making that change manually, uh, you go put that in as a task in Ansible. And then you ask Ansible to do that for you. I've included here one way of, of running that uh, Ansible role against your local system. Uh, there's a lot more ways to actually run Ansible, including uh, remotely. So if you do have a lot of machines that you're managing, uh, there are definitely better ways to do this. But I just wanted to give you know, a very basic example that doesn't require a lot of setup. And I have faith that anybody who's interested can uh, you know, take a look at the documentation. And it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, and a pretty common task in Ansible. So if, if you do have that use case, I, I have faith in you. Um, 
So I, I mentioned before packages, and uh, there are many different package managers, and I end up using a lot of different package managers for different reasons. Um, and my, my suggestion is that for each package manager you use in your environment to maintain a list of what you want to install. And uh, here, here are some examples. So you have the distro packages. Those are you know, RPMs for Red Hat family distros and Debs for Debian family distros. Uh, flat packs. I use those for a number of GUI applications. Uh, snaps are an option as well. Um, and finally, I've, I've recently become a big fan of uh, Brew, specifically Linux Brew, because uh, there's a lot of stuff packaged there that hasn't yet uh, been packaged into a, a distro's repos. I want to pause to talk a little bit about um, package origins and, and uh, how I think about those. So, so I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different package managers, and I, like, routinely, personally use a bunch of them. Uh, and I have some preferences and some advice, and I, I want to start by saying I have my reasons, and you'll find that you may have different preferences and different uh, reasoning. But first, I prefer distro packages. And the reason that I prefer distro packages is because there's a lot of hard work that the distro maintainers are doing to ensure that a given uh, package works on your distro. So it's, it's likely to be uh, of better quality, generally. Then you've got, uh, for me, if I can't find a package in uh, distro's repositories, I'll then turn and see if there's a flat pack. And I mentioned before, a lot of GUI applications are packaged this way. Uh, you can also often get newer versions, even if you do have a distro package, you can get newer versions out of Flatpak. And it's generally the same experience uh, across distros. Uh, same can be said um, for, for snaps as well. Um, I happen to prefer Flatpaks over snaps, but that's an option too. Uh, I mentioned uh, Linux brew. Homebrew, and this is the same across both Mac and Linux for the most part. Uh, and, and I think I already mentioned this, but uh, oftentimes there are things that are packaged there that are not packaged in either you know, the distro packages or Flatpak. Uh, I, I find especially like a lot of things in the like Kubernetes ecosystem are packaged there. Um, so, so for me, I end up installing tons and tons of stuff uh, r related to Kubernetes through uh, Brew. And uh, yeah, I did already mention snaps are an option too. And uh, as I said before, you might have reasons to have a different sort of um, preference for, for each of these different package managers. But, but in general, um, I think you can establish for yourself a uh, sort of pattern where you say, OK, I'm looking to install a piece of software. I'm going to look first at this source. And then if it doesn't exist, look at another source. If it doesn't exist, look at another source until you find a, a good source for that package. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, configuration files. So, so the first type is, that I'll talk about, and this is all very basic Ansible, um, but if you want to land just a config file somewhere, you can simply drop that file in the files directory within that role and then write a little bit of code. And this is what the Ansible code looks like to land this particular um, example. And it's, it's all pretty straightforward. If your needs get a little bit more complicated, uh, then you might need to use templates. Uh, so, so here's a quick, somewhat contrived example. But if I want to land a uh, sudoers configuration that allows my user to do anything with sudo without typing a password, which, you know, first off, please don't do that for security reasons, unless it's a machine you just don't care about. But if I want to land that, I need to know what my username is going to be. Making this a template allows me to take advantage of Ansible uh, gathering information beforehand, 
and then this becomes portable. It doesn't matter what my username is on a particular machine. Uh, this will work. And I'll say um, one other thing that's worth keeping in mind. I, I did mention this is a contrived example. Uh, with a lot of the common types of configuration that you do typically on a Linux machine, there are often Ansible modules that are better suited for that. Um, and, and I'll just go ahead and point out, there is like a sudoers uh, module that's worth using instead of this, uh, but hopefully this illustrates the point. Okay, so one, once you've done that and you've gotten in the habit of um, making changes locally that way, the, the next logical thing to think about is, okay, I've got that, and now I want to apply those changes to another machine, or maybe you replaced your machine. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You install uh, the role. There's a dash dash force option there that asks the Ansible Galaxy command to overwrite whatever you have installed there before. So that's a quick and easy way of getting it updated so that the same command will work um, you know, for future runs. And then notice I've got the same uh, quick little hacky uh, way of running Ansible again here. Uh, and, and also, as I mentioned before, uh, if you are trying to apply this to a remote machine, uh, Ansible does that really well. Uh, they have great documentation around it. I'm not gonna go into too many details there. Um, other things worth thinking about in terms of capabilities are Ansible has modules for managing users and groups and your, your sort of system level services, including things like systemd and cron jobs. And it's super flexible. You can also get Ansible to just run commands or scripts for you. So uh, one can pretty quickly, you know, surmise that, uh, you know, there's, there's pretty much nothing that Ansible can't do. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, of how convenient, uh, how uh, ergonomic. And, and that is why it is worth looking to see if there is a module that exists for doing what you want, because the ergonomics are often better. All right, uh, now we're gonna shift gears a little bit, and I'm gonna talk about the user side of things and a tool called Chamoy. So Chamoy is, is a, it's not a product, it's, it's just a project. It's a dot .files manager. And I'll say in general, uh, you can replace Chamoy with any other dot .files manager and use a similar sort of workflow and a similar paradigm. Um, so, so keep that in mind. I know, um, you know there, there was some talk of uh, Nix, I'm, I'm curious, how many folks in the room uh, w went to the talk about uh, managing your, your home or user land with Nix? Okay, only a couple. Um, but I, for those, I would say, you know, you can apply the same principle here. You can say, okay, I wanna manage the, the system changes with Ansible, and then I wanna use Nix, for example, for your home directory and user land. But why Chamoy? For me, um, Chamoy is an interesting little tool. It is uh, lighter weight than Ansible. A as you probably noticed, anytime you're automating some of those configurations, there's a little bit of setup to it. There's, uh, you know, you gotta write some YAML. Um, so so there's, there's just a little bit of process to it. <clears throat> Chamoy, is, is, as I'll show in a few minutes, is much, much, much lighter weight. Uh, I'll also say it's, it's not so lightweight that it's just files in a Git repo. So I think it strikes an interesting balance of being lightweight, but also having some capabilities. And um, I like the ergonomics, personally. Um, I'll say also uh, what is interesting, I've made a, a sort of personal decision about where to draw the line between automating something with Ansible and automating something with Chamoy, and I'm presenting that here as like a sort of concrete, okay, this half is Ansible and this half is Chamoy, but um, you know, you can move more things into Ansible if you're so inclined. 
So uh, first off, Chamoy, uh, easiest way to install it is they have a curl to bash. Uh, as someone a little bit more security minded, I didn't particularly like this. Uh, but you know, you can do, you can review the script and there's not too much going on in it. Um, if you want to use brew, it's also brew installable. Um, but this command uh, both installs Chamoy and asks Chamoy to look for uh, your dot files in a, in a GitHub repo. So uh, it's, it's sort of both an install and an initial sort of provisioning step. So, show of hands, uh, how many folks in here, I, I hate to be that guy, but I'm going to be that guy, uh, how many folks like Vim? Okay. How many folks like Emacs? Okay. What about VS Code? All right, cool, cool. Uh, what about VS Codium? Okay, cool. Um, I'm bringing these all up because these are all editors that people use, um, you know, very popular. And they all have configuration. And uh, the, you end up curating for anybody who hasn't used some of those. You end up curating your configuration over time. And this is the kind of configuration that I think Chamoy is a good option for. Um, it's also good for things like your bash RC, uh, you know, if you're a ZSH aficionado, um, good for your ZSH RC. Out of curiosity, um, I'll, I'll do the same thing again, I'll be that guy. How many, ha, how many folks prefer bash in the room? Okay, and how many folks prefer Z shell? Okay, about 50-50. Um, I'm personally uh, a Bash person, but I work with so many talented people that love Z Shell that, that I can't fault in it either. <laughs> uh, another good example of, of a configuration that you may or may not be aware of, but you, if you're doing any sort of general development you're definitely interacting with in one way or another, is your Git configuration. I think a lot of times people are using commands to manipulate their Git configuration, but it is still writing a text file that you can um, check in and sync between machines. And the, the workflow is um, pretty simple. Uh, you, you generally ask Chamoy to manage something with Chamoy add and then path to the file. And then you do typical Git things like a Git commit uh, and then a, a Git push. So um, th these are all some pretty basic examples of a uh, use case where you have a file and you basically just want the contents of that file elsewhere. Um, in some cases, and, and actually the git config is a good one for me, uh, you actually want a little bit of drift between one machine and another. So sort of similar to Ansible, Chamoy has some templating. Uh, and so here's what I do with my git config. I use a different email at home and at work and it makes it pretty easy to see if you're looking at code that I've pushed out whether I was doing it at work or at home and the way that I do that is I template the, the email and uh, Chamoy will actually ask you, I'm glossing over a few details but because it's pretty well documented on the Chamoy site but um, Chamoy will actually ask you when you first install it on a machine to fill in uh, variables that you've declared. And so that's uh, something I use for my git config. I mentioned tools, and I didn't really dive into what I mean by tools. But um, for me, I often find uh, you know, stuff either out on GitHub or somebody, you know, hear about it at a conference hear about tools that are things that aren't in any package managers aside from maybe like the Python, uh, like, like available as a pip installable package, or sometimes people have neat tools that they're distributing as, as NPM packages. Sometimes I find tools that are really useful that all they've done is push out uh, binary as, as a GitHub release. And I've found um, there, there's a feature of Chamoy, this is one of the reasons that, that I've been enjoying Chamoy. 
um, there is a way to get Chamoy to handle installing those for you. So here is a, a quick uh, snippet, and this is directly from my um, dot files. But what I'm doing here is I'm getting Chamoy to install uh, Olama, and I've got it parameterized so that the version that it installs is actually maintained in a, in a YAML file. What's neat about that is that you can get tools that do um, automated dependency updates. Uh, specifically, I'm using Renovate for this. Uh, you can get it to actually watch that uh, GitHub projects for new releases, and then you can pull them down uh, you know, pretty easily. I'll, I'll show in a moment my, um, some PRs that, that Renovate generated for that. Um, there's also, I, I mentioned Python packages, so a pattern that I am playing around with and have enjoyed quite a bit is I keep a directory in my home directory, tool slash Python, and I manage that particular directory as a poetry project. And what this lets me do is if I want to install a Python-based uh, tool, I can do poetry install in that directory, and then it gets added to that um, dependencies that Poetry is managing. And then what's, what's interesting is similarly, because this is just a like standard sort of Poetry project, uh, I can get uh, automated updates for that as well with uh, Renovate or, or Dependabot. And I mentioned NPM. You can follow a similar pattern there where you create a directory for NPM-based tools and then you can install into that project uh, all the tools you want. Might run into some issues at some point with um, conflicts, but, but so far I haven't hit any. Um, and um, one other thing that uh, I make use of here that, that is a neat Chamoy feature is Chamoy has uh, hooks, so you can write scripts that perform additional actions after you apply uh, updates from a Chamoy repo. So here I have a script that after every update, I ensure that uh, Poetry, which is a Python package manager, um, installs the dependencies that are in that updated um, Poetry project. Uh, shifting gears, a little bit. Um, I'm a big fan of, of sharing scripts with folks. So uh, at work, uh, one thing I do a lot is uh, we have like a team Git repo that we keep scripts in. And uh, one very handy thing to do is to add that to your path so you have easy access to it. And then also to push that out so that uh, other team members can contribute and they can also benefit from you know any little scripts uh, that, that get written. Um, and Chamoy has the ability to reference other repos. You can do that either with like get submodules or there are a couple other options. Um, but, but that's been an extremely handy pattern as well. Uh, and then obviously you can also check those scripts directly into your dot files if you're so inclined. And I'll do that with things where I have maybe a quick little script that seems like it would only be useful to me. Um, people can still then see it if they go to my dot files repo. Um, so, so for me, there's, there's almost like another bifurcation where I say, is this something that team members or other folks might be interested in? Okay, I'll stick it in its own repo uh, or the team repo. Or is it something that's really just useful to me? Okay, I'll stick it directly in my um, Chamoy repo. Um, once you get a flow going with Chamoy, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to use uh, elsewhere. Uh, you can use that same command initially, or uh, if, if you're on a, a brand new machine that you have Chamoy installed, uh, you can just do that. Uh, getting updates is, is as simple as, rather than init, you do Chamoy update. You don't actually have to specify the, the username or the apply. You might have to specify the apply flag, actually. I can't recall. Anyways, um, so, so that's sort of a whirlwind tour of 
uh, Ansible for sort of system level uh, config, and then a lighter weight approach with with Chamoy um, for managing you know personal config files. Uh, I, I stated early on, you know, that my goal in this talk was really to sort of inspire folks to kind of dig deeper, dig in, and see what all, what's out there, and to to share. Um, here are some some thoughts for other places to get more inspiration. So uh, first off, I'd recommend on the Ansible side looking at the Ansible Galaxy uh, site because that is a repository of community and partner and uh, you know, individuals, just tons of um, Ansible code to do various tasks. Uh, so if you are looking to use Ansible for some system automation, it's worth checking there and checking the modules. Um, the Ansible documentation is actually fantastic. If you are trying to do a thing and there's a module for it, nine times out of ten, there's an example of exactly how you do that in the documentation itself. And then on the, the Chamoy side, uh, you can search GitHub for topic Chamoy. A lot of folks will tag their um, dot .files repos with that tag. And so there's a lot of great examples you can go learn from there. Uh, and, and in general, um, for those who may not know this, actually, I'll ask, um, how many folks already, like, were familiar with the practice of uh, dot .files repos? Okay, okay. So, so I'll say it's not like uh, just a Chamoy thing. Um, there are lots of other options for managing dot .files, and some people just use a plain Git repo. So if you ever want to know, you know, how someone uh, manages their configuration, um, you know, for me, I like to see what people do in their Vim configs and things like that, you can actually go uh, search in GitHub for dot .files repos in general. And there's, you know, it's just a, a wealth of, of knowledge there. Um, I have a couple of repos, so you can kind of see what I've done uh, if you want to see um, some of the things that I have. Uh, and I might actually go ahead and flip over and show off a couple things real fast. So here is, is my uh, environment repo, the tasks main.yaml. And I actually prefer to keep as much as possible in here because you can actually organize things a little differently. With Ansible, you can push some of these details out into other files, but I don't personally, for, for my own config, like to push those details out because it, it, you know, is one more thing to go manage. Um, but I'll, you know, configure repositories. I will um, import um, GPG keys for the, the repos. I'll install RPMs with DNF. I mentioned um, flat packs, so I set up the FlatHub repo, and then I install some software with Flatpak, and then uh, somewhere down here we've got uh, I've got some packages I install with Brew. And so, like for me, if you, if you ever want to know, well, what kinds of tools is Kevin using? Uh, you know, you can check out this repo, and, and there's a big list. And um, the other thing I wanted to show real quick is on the dot .file side, uh, first off, these are Renovate uh, bot up, update PRs, and this is what I was talking about before, where by pushing some of those details into uh, either the Poetry project or pushing it into that version's YAML file, I get, you know, these PRs straight from, from Renovate for updating newer versions of those tools. So even though these aren't packaged with a distro, uh, I can get them updated pretty easily. And um, other thing I will show real quick, I mentioned that it's a little bit different than just your uh, config files in a repo. You'll notice that there are some conventions in here where um, files that begin with a dot, they get replaced with dot underscore. There's some other conventions that, that Chamoy uses. So browsing these is, you know, maybe a bit of a learning curve. Uh, but it is all still readable. Like I can click in here 
and you know you can see you know it's just plain text under the cover and uh, a lot of times I'm not using uh, templates but uh, w when I am it's still pretty readable all right okay One more thing I wanted to mention for those who may have an interest in checking out like some of the Ansible products is um, Red Hat Developer. So if you go to developers.reddit.com, we've got a lot of like neat stuff you can try for free. Uh, it's a it's a no cost subscription for individuals. So uh, if you're an individual, you can, if you, and you want to check some of the stuff, some of the Red Hat related stuff around Ansible out, I'd, I'd recommend checking it out. And with that, we can move to Q and A. Hi. Um, with Ansible, you should probably mention Matt Gerling. He wrote the book and also has a wide variety of YouTube tutorials on using Ansible. He's an advocate, um, not necessarily with Red Hat, but uh, Matt Gerling is um, probably uh, most responsible for onboarding people to Ansible. So definitely deserves a mention. Yeah. I yeah, for sure. And um, I assume you're talking about Gearling guy? His yep. his roles, yep, Jeff Gearling. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, he, he's a very prolific, like, Ansible community person who has contributed. He's not a Red Hatter, but he's contributed a lot of um, Ansible code, a lot of roles, a lot of modules, yeah. Yep, for sure. And uh, if you... I actually can just jump over there and just to give folks an idea, if you go galaxy.ansible.com, can't see if I'm typing that correctly, but I think we're good. So you can search and, and like if you were to search Gearling, you'll see tons and tons of, of things that he's produced come up and they're pretty widely used and as mentioned, yeah, he has some some nice videos and tutorials. And again, not a Red Hatter. Yeah. Any other questions? What do you do for like secrets that you might need to inject an API token or a database password? I, I'm having a hard time hearing. What do you do for secrets that you might secrets. need to inject? Yeah. Ah, yes. So I would say it depends a little bit on whether you're looking at Ansible or looking at a tool like Chamoy. If you're looking at Ansible, there's a feature of Ansible called uh, Ansible Vault. Uh, and Ansible Vault will let you store secrets in an encrypted store. Um, don't have a slide prepared for that, but um, that would be the thing to look for, Ansible Vault. If you're using Chamoy, uh, Chamoy actually has a lot of plugins. Let's see. And if you go specifically, I think the reference page, they have examples of the, they're, they're essentially template commands that you use to interact with password managers. And they support a bunch of the common ones. Um, so, so that's an option. If you wanna have your, your config files or other files that, that have secrets in them, and you wanna check in the templates, but keep the secrets uh, safe, that would be the way to go. Um, yeah, just a quick comment. You had mentioned dot files on GitHub, but if anybody is learning Chamois, the author, Tom Payne has all of his dot files on GitHub, and yeah. he uses practically every feature in Chamois. So if you want to learn how to do something or want to figure out a feature, it's available, and he make, takes advantage of that. So a couple of years ago, it was really useful for me to learn. Um, so. Yeah, I can repeat that. Um, don't know if it comes across in the recording, but the comment was the author of Chamois. Uh, T.W. Payne on GitHub, he actually 
keeps a dot .files repo, and you can see examples of his stuff. Uh, and the comment was that it's a great place to look because he uses pretty much every feature at some point or another. <laughs> yep, yep, we're all human. Any other questions? If not, then I will step back here for just a moment. I want to say uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for attending. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with me, again, I've thrown up a couple of ways um, where you can come talk to me in general. Uh, and th there are some other Red Hatter sessions. If you want to see you know, what other Red Hat talks were at scale or are upcoming, uh, that's QR code in the link. And again, thank you, everybody. <laughs>